Our reading from the Word of God is found in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. The text that God gives is found in verses 10 through 14. So our text this morning comes verse through from verses 10 through 14. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, and thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten, here's our text, when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power, and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against thee this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. May God bless our reading of his word. The text, as we announced, is verses 10 through 14 of Deuteronomy 8. It's obvious that on this National Thanksgiving Day, the focus is primarily on material things. 
and our need to be thankful for the material things that God provides. One is not being less spiritual by thanking God for material things than he is when he's thankful for spiritual things. One is equally correct to do both. And it's good and fitting that while the scriptures don't demand that we gather together on this national holiday, that we take time to do just that and express our gratitude in the best possible way, and that is with the preaching of the word, with worship together to our God, admitting and confessing that we are very dependent upon him for all things. We look at this passage of God's Word, and while we're dealing only with those five verses, 10 through 14 specifically, the context almost explains them very, very well. And so we use as our theme, when full, then bless, forget not. When full, don't forget to bless. We deal first of all with the fullness and what that is spoken of in this passage. And then we look at the danger that comes with that, the spiritual danger. That is that we would forget or that we would be lifted up. And then thirdly, we look at the calling that God gives and not in our text, but before and after he speaks about to humble and to test, to prove. And the test is, are we going to hear his voice all the time and show that we hear it with a life of obedience to his commandments? So, first of all, when full. Moses had led the children of Israel for 40 years. In that time, they never lacked, but they never had leftovers. Never. They had enough, and they never had to get a new set of shoes or sandals for 40 years. No new garments. God sustained them. The foot didn't swell, nor did anything wear out. Now Moses says, now when you're going to go into this land, it is going to be a tremendous change. There is going to be an obvious and marked contrast between what you've had. You're going to have leftovers. You've been drinking water that came out of a rock. You're going to go into a country in a land where there's wells already dug, but there's springs everywhere feeding the rivers and the creeks. You're going to go into a land and you can set your tents aside and even burn them. But you're going to go into a land where you're going to go into houses that are already built and furnished. The inhabitants are going to be destroyed and you're going to be able to occupy houses already constructed. You can get rid of your garments and your sandals because there's going to be all kinds of them already there in the houses. You won't have to be wondering when you plant, are we going to have enough to sustain us? Because the barns are going to be full. Everything is going to be vineyards. You won't have to wait for the vineyard to, over years and years to develop or the orchard to develop until you can get a full harvest. They're already going to be built. 
and constructed, and they're already going to be yielding the best that they can. Grapes, so large, two men have to carry a cluster. Canaan is a land of plenty. Now, how are you going to handle that? You've learned, well, God was getting you to learn what it was like to deal with adversity and poverty. Now you're going to have to deal with prosperity. In the old dispensation, of course, everything was types, shadows. So the prosperity that they would experience when they came into the land of Canaan was going to be a type it was a type, and they received it that way, of the prosperity of spiritually that was theirs in Jesus Christ, the Messiah that was to come. So God was showing to them the riches of his love and the riches of his covenant life with them in that physical prosperity. They also knew, as we've seen from Psalm 16, when we deal with the inheritance and the lot, that when they entered into the land of Canaan, they were going to have a picture of heaven. So they saw the types. They saw what things were typical and what they were pointing to, and they received it. And they were to remember that that's what they were type pictures of so that they would know the riches of God's relationship to them, even as they dealt with the material and physical prosperity. Now for us. In this dispensation, those types have passed. And we have more of the reality, more to come, but we have more of the reality than they did. So in our day and age, we live with an abundance. Even the poorest of us, now here's the problem, that the poorest of us look at the rest of others and say, well, I'm pretty poor because I don't have what they have and I don't have what they have. And... But even the poorest among us is not watching our children starve. Even the poorest among us have leftovers. Even the poorest of, of, of us don't have just one set of footwear or one garment. The poorest among us doesn't have to worry about heat in the winter. Now, not focusing on the poorest, but on focusing on the prosperity that is our experience day by day. He speaks of the wine and the oil. We just sang of that. The wine and the oil. We don't just have water. We have wine. We have pop. We have riches. But we have to learn. Just as the children of Israel had to learn how properly to handle that. The Apostle Paul in writing to Timothy in two places. He didn't, in verse chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, he condemns those who said it's better not to marry and it would be better to have poverty. And he says, no, no. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. Comma. Nothing is to be refused. Everything is to be enjoyed if it be received with thanksgiving and it be sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And then in chapter 6, he speaks to us 
And he says to Timothy, this is what you have to do to the poor, and this is what you do to the rich. You charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust, and literally, the uncertainty of riches. Trust not uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. God gives us to enjoy what he gives to us. To enjoy as he gives all things and gives all things richly, but to enjoy them. So whether we have less than somebody else or more than somebody else in the congregation, we have to realize that all of us live in the midst of the kind of prosperity that the children of Israel would find when they walked into the land of Canaan. There are dangers. This is the focus. This is what must get our attention and wake us up and make us aware. There are problems with abundance, just as there are problems and dangers with little. Then you get the familiar verse that covers both out of the book of Proverbs chapter 30. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but rather feed me with food convenient, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. So there's dangers for both. The emphasis for us today is the dangers that come to us because of riches. We want to point out three as they arise in the text. The first danger is the danger of just not being thankful, not being thankful at all. Why, why is it that we have to be told to be thankful or that we should be thankful? Well, the reason for that is because we must recognize that in our human natures, the human natures that are ours because of, of with Adam, is that we often, we are naturally selfish. Fallen man is selfish. And the natural man that's in all of us does not want to acknowledge the eternal power and the Godhead of God. We, we don't want to acknowledge that in him. And so Romans 1 tells us that when we aren't thankful when we don't want to acknowledge his eternal power and Godhead, then we glorify him not as God, neither are thankful. Romans 1 21. Naturally unthankful. So we have to be aware of that part of us so that through the sanctified, regenerated heart, rather, through the regenerated heart, we exercise ourselves unto being thankful unto gratitude to God in all things. So first, look and be careful and realize we have work to do always, every day, in order to be thankful. We've got to fight and overcome an old man. Second, the text speaks of the danger of being lifted up. Verse 14. Then thine heart be lifted up. That Hebrew word means to be raised. It means to exalt and magnify oneself. Why is it that if a 
man worked really, really hard and he brought about a successful business that when he is old and he has to pass it on to his son or his son's son, that that second generation and that third generation just seem not to get it. But having the wealth provided by the earlier generation, they are rather proud. They think there's something because they've got the dollars and the cents. They've got the bucks. And they can buy this and they can buy that. The danger is that we be lifted up. Prosperity, the ability to buy whatever we, not what we need, but whatever we might want, small or large, can give to us that we begin to trust in riches. And we show that with an arrogance. We show that as if we're prosperous in business or the children have the dollars. So then their opinions about ecclesiastical matters or political matters are to be listened to because they've got the dollars to back it up. Prosperity intoxicates. That's the warning that Paul wanted Timothy to give to the rich, that they trust not in the living God who gave it to them. So the second danger is that we have to be aware of how easily it is for us to take credit, to accept and expect that we are to be thanked for what has been gifted to us. We claim that we got it by our might. We have it by our strength. This is verse 17. That thou say in thine heart, my power, my might, my business acumen, my wisdom, I got it. My power and my, that might of mine hand hath gotten me this well. And the way the economy has gone since the last little recession in 08 and 09, prosperity is very, very evident for all of us. And we have to be alert to the dangers that we think we did it. It is easy to get what we need and more beside. And then we don't have to rely on the giver to be high-minded, high-minded, claiming for ourselves that we've gained it and gotten it. First danger, it's our nature to be unthankful. Be careful, be aware, just be aware. Second danger, high-minded. Lift it up. I got it. I gained it. Third danger is right in touch with it, but it's a distinct and separate. It's lest thou forget. Forget. Forget Jehovah thy God. Forget that he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Another way to say that is this. Forget what I deserve by one right. Hell. Forget and then realize and take to myself as if I've got it. Just as somebody who is healthy does not need to go to a doctor. 
so someone who is rich doesn't need help from the Almighty. Real easy to think that. And someone who doesn't see their sin doesn't need Jesus. Now, admittedly, there's times when we don't purposefully forget. We're not consciously forgetting. We're not deliberately doing it. We don't say, I don't want to think about him. In fact, we often will say when it's brought to our attention, I, I want to remember him. I don't want to go through a day and not be conscious of my need of him. I want to. But that's why just as it's our nature not to be thankful, so it's our nature to forget. Forget that we came out of the poverty of slavery to sin. We were born and conceived dead in sin. We were enslaved to sin. Every one of us must remember that that's what is ours by nature. And if we're able to even think of him and to know him, that that means we've received a tremendous, wonderful gift that God has opened our eyes to himself. And that's why, again, just like, well, if we would go through the book of Deuteronomy, I would love somebody to do that and count how many times it's Jehovah thy God or Jehovah your God. So we're told over and over and over about that relationship where he, he is ours because he made himself ours. We're his but the language is always, we're his, or he is ours. He's mine. And you forget Jehovah? Now, if we put it that way, we're going to scratch our heads. Why would we ever forget him? Can you breathe? He gifted that to you. Can you see? He gifted that to you. Can you hear? He gifted that to you. You need glasses? He gifted that to you. You need hearing aids? He gifted. You need a walker? He gifted that to you. He gifted us with everything. Job said it. I was born naked. And I worked for a funeral home. So I know I'm going to die naked. I have nothing. The Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of Jehovah. That's where he wants us to go. But it's so difficult to remember. Here's the danger for me. Right here, right now. We get it. We get it. Give us two hours. Three, four, five hours. What are we going to be doing this afternoon? Remembering? We're going to have to stop. We're going to have to be still. We're going to have to make ourselves think and find a way to remember. Sure, when we sit down, we're going to pray. We'll remember then. And one or two minutes later, maybe less. Be aware. This passage, this thought of Moses inspired to bring to the children of Israel is to make us aware of the danger that not the world, but the children of God, those who have Jehovah as their God, the dangers we have and have to be aware of. We open our eyes to the reality 
that God calls us to so focus on him in love that we keep his commandments. Notice that's how the whole book is really written in this chapter. He starts that in the first verse. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless Jehovah thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not Jehovah thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Thank him. Thank him by acknowledging publicly and privately and repeatedly that we deserve nothing, but that we have been greatly gifted by the good giver of all. See anything in your possession and know the source. Look up. Thank him for delivering you from the slavery of sin so that you can thank him and can do good in praising him. There's millions that cannot they can't break down that old man. They can't put him off. They're under the bondage and slavery of sin. So they cannot be thankful. We can thank him for opening our eyes to the reality of what he has gifted to us. Thank him then for the unspeakable gift, Jesus Christ in salvation. We can describe as the psalmist did, and we sing from Psalm 104. We can do it in the 69, Psalm 69. There is something about the gift of Jesus that we can try to put an expression to, and, and we do, but it's always beyond whatever we can say. Unspeakable, incomprehensible, the wonder of that love that was behind God's gift to you and to me of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just have to stammer and ask him to forgive us because we can't put it into words adequately how wonderful that gift is. Thank him for daily guiding us through the wilderness of this life, for teaching us how to deal with sorrow and with pain and with health and with birth. Thank him for the promise of an inheritance that we know our believing loved ones will have and that the old ones pray to receive soon. We thank God also by blessing him when we sanctify all things. With the word of God in prayer. It's a good thing when the young kids who are on basketball teams have the word of God opened and they pray in the locker rooms before they go out. Sometimes I wonder why we fans don't do that. To sanctify 
all things with the Word of God and prayer. Make it, make it a holy thing. Sanctify it. Use it as a way to praise God. To thank Him. That's how we praise Him. Striving to use every material possession that we have. Every one of us, or I didn't have to walk, I could walk, but most of us got in cars, vehicles. Whether it's a beater or it's a brand new one. We, we just don't even think of it being a gift. that we are to sanctify every time we use it. We sanctify by sharing. Beautiful things happen on this occasion and on Christmas. We give what we've been given as an expression of our thanks. We show and demonstrate gratitude with the collection today. Just a minor little way, but a very real way in which we express our gratitude to God for his gift. We also thank him mightily by thanking him to, for forgiving us when we forget for forgiving us when we have those moments when we're lifted up and we're taking credit for what we have. We thank him for forgiving us and not wavering in his love and devotion to us so that when we're not grateful, he still stays right there with us. But now, lastly this, we thank and bless him by keeping his commandments. Now, all of us know that we can keep the commandments outwardly, but the true keeping of God's commandments, statutes, and judgments is when we do it out of grateful love. Here it is again. Render grateful returns of fervent, ardent love. Everything that he does for us is motivated by his love for us. You know how easy it is. You almost have to stop yourself that when somebody says, some, says to you, I love you, there's the instinct for us to say, I love you too. He never stops saying, Beloved. He tells us that over and over. And he calls us to be so focused on what he gives to us that we say, I love you too. And we show that we love him by I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to do it how he wants me to do it. I want to do it his way. I want to thank him because I love him. And I want to show that I love him by keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes. Amen. Our Father... As thy children, we thank thee. We can never thank thee enough, and we know it's going to take an eternity, and then we still will not be finished. But work within us never to forget. Thou dost prove us and humble us. May we walk ever humbly with thee, our God. Amen.